you have me? Okay, go ahead. I'm Courtney Patton. This is RTI, and we are interviewing on February 17, 2004, in Reno, Nevada. Reno, Nevada. Okay. So your name is? My name is John Sanchez. I was in the Army during the war. I tried to get in the Navy in 1942. But because I couldn't see out of the right eye, I couldn't make it. So I went to work in the mines in Ruth, Nevada. And it was a, uh, a necessary industry for the war effort. Uh, and I couldn't get in the service. Mm -hmm. So I quit the mines and then I got drafted into the Army in 1943. I uh, left uh, Ruth, Nevada in May of 1943 and ended up in Fort Douglas in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, from there I, was, I went to Baxter General Hospital in Spokane and then to Seattle Area Station Hospital and then to Barnes General in Seattle that was and then to Barnes General Hospital in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, that's because I was limited service due to, due to my, my uh, bad eye. Uh, I still wanted to get into uh, an active fighting service, so I got an appointment with a doctor in Fort Lawton, Washington. And I had learned that if you memorize the eye charts, you could get by. So I memorized the eye chart and uh, the doctor had me put my hand over my blind eye and I read it good and I had memorized so I put my hand over my left eye but I didn't realize he changed the charts so he changed the chart and he said what are you trying to do he thought I was trying to get out of the service and I said no I don't want to get out of the service I want to get in a combat outfit he said you can't with a blind eye I said you can if you put 2020. Well, I can't do that. Well, we talked a little while and he said, well, okay. <laughs> so he put 2020. So then I went to Fort Lewis, Washington in the infantry. And from Fort Lewis, Washington, I went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, again in the infantry. And both times I had to go through basic training. And then I ended up at uh, Fort Benning Parachute School and uh, trained there, got a, uh, a leave when we finished our training. Uh, wh I went home probably the f end of October of 1944, the 1st of November. I got married to my wife who was still a senior in high school. In fact, I went in class and got her and said, let's go on. We got married and then two days later, I was on, on my way back to Fort Benning, then on a boat we, to, to Europe. And I ended up in the 101st Airborne Division in Company D, 502 Parachute Infantry Regiment, just in time to get into the Battle of the Bulge in Bastogne over there in, uh, in Europe. Now, that, that's been a battle that's been publicized all over. And, Everybody knows about it. And now today, whenever I look at TV, I see the 101st is right in the middle of everything, you know. And it gives you a sense of pride and, and a sense of sorrow to see all these young fellers getting killed over there. And you wonder for what. But anyway, uh, I was there and uh, served in uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Then from there went to Camp Marmalone, France. The war ended. And uh, we floated around thinking we were going to have to go to Japan. So we went into some training again. But luckily, the war ended in the end of August of 1945. And that ended the training, uh, the harsh training. And we came home, and I got discharged in 1946. and went back to Ruth. And at that time, I was slated to go back to the mines, but instead I went to the uh, 
took advantage of the GI Bill of Rights, and I came over to Reno and went to school here, um, graduated, went to back to the mines to make enough money to go to law school. In the meantime, I had two children, and uh, after I graduated from law school in 1955, I came back to Reno, and I've been here since then, practicing law, and uh, I'm still practicing on a part-time basis. Now, with regard to service over there, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I had been recently married, so I wanted to get home like everybody else, but frankly, I enjoyed the service. It was what I was looking for. At age 19 and 20, you want some excitement in your life, and I have no regrets about having gone over there and, and um, participating in whatever we had to do. But to me, it was, uh, it was exciting. I was glad to get out, but I was glad I was in. Now, Tell us about your boot camp experiences. What kind of things happened to you, uh, you when you finally got to the infantry boot camp? Well, in boot camp, it was just training. You know, you're, you're drilling, you're training, you're learning your weapons, you're learning maneuvers, learning, learning close order drill. You learn all these things because <clears throat> having been raised in Ruth, Nevada, you didn't know anything, you know. <laughs> there, was the, there was a weekly newspaper that was very skimpy. There were no radios there at the time. You were lucky if you had a radio. Uh, you, you were even luckier if you could get a, a phonograph to play Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, Tommy Dorsey, Harry James, you know. So uh, boot camp was, was again, exciting. Being young, these things are more like uh, you're competing in sports, you know. And so it was a matter of uh, getting up early, um, working all, all day, working hard, taking hikes, uh, a lot of forced marches. You get up early in the morning and uh, the outfit I was in, you had three marches you had to undergo periodically and one was an 11 mile forced march. You had to actually run hard and walk hard and you had a time limit and then uh, the next one would be a 16 miler and then the last one of that series would be a 25 mile march and you did it at night because uh, it got too hot in the daytime both in uh, in uh, Fort Lewis and in uh, Camp Shelby Mississippi now that's that's what boot, boot camp was about and the food I found the food always good because we had just gotten over a depression you know and uh, the food we had was so-so at home. It wasn't all that good. So getting into the service was really a treat. You had a lot of different foods to eat and a lot of it. So I didn't mind that at all. Uh, perhaps I didn't mind it because <clears throat> I was orphaned when I was nine. My mother died when I was nine. And uh, uh, I had a sister that was seven and a brother that was five. And we were raised just by by neighbors around there, you know, everybody in Ruth, Nevada took care of everybody else. And in those days, there used to be a lot of orphaned kids because the parents, the, the fathers usually got killed in the mines. Mining was dangerous work and there were a lot of deaths. But anyway, I finally ended up at Camp Shelby, Miss, uh, excuse me, um, I, I forgot the f parachute school and I just slipped my mind. Fort Benning, ended up in Fort Benning, and then it started to really get exciting because that was a lot of running, a lot of calisthenics, learning how to handle your parachute, learning how to jump out of airplanes, and it was just a very exciting period. The training lasted, if I, if I remember right, about six weeks, but it was an exciting six weeks, and you were working all the time. From the time you woke up till the time you went to bed, there was something to do. And uh, they used to wake us up at four o'clock in the morning. And uh, right off the bat, you started running. Everything you did in the paratroops had to be at quick time, which meant you ran. If you ran out of your barracks to the, to the mess hall, you, you had to run. If you ran to the latrine, you had to run. They just wanted you running all the time to stay in shape. Uh, 
but we learned how to jump, how to, uh, how to board a plane, how to jump out of a plane. And, and with me, uh, not having ever been on Ruth and not ever having been on an airplane, I got on the airplane and I could see out the horizon and I thought, what am I doing here, you know? <laughs> Why, why, why couldn't I be back in Ruth, Nevada? And I thought, I volunteered for this too, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I made my first jump and it was quite exciting. It was a lot different than I thought it was going to be. It was really exciting. So after that, you look for, I looked forward to it. Um, I made uh, seven jumps before I went overseas. And then overseas, we had some practice jumps, not many of them. I never jumped in combat because when I got over there um, was during the, the Battle of the Bulge and they didn't jump troops in there. They drove us up in, in trucks, right? The, 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 other, the infantry that was being beaten by the Germans, uh, they were uh, surprised and they weren't prepared and they were coming toward the back lines and we were going up. And we didn't know what was going on. Uh, you know, the soldiers would be, would be coming back and you won't like it up there and you'll be sorry, you know, everybody in unison. But when we got there, we found out in short order that it was, it was a tough battle. It was very cold. Uh, we were encircled by the enemy uh, for our 10 days. Uh, we ran out of uh, food, ammunition, medical supplies. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the Germans send in a, a major to uh, to accept our surrender and General McAuliffe, who was the acting general of the 101st Division, uh, said, well, what is this? And it was uh, one of the, his aides told him and he says, tell them nuts. And the German uh, major didn't know what the word nuts meant, but he, he got it clear and when they went back then the Germans were, were quite uh, upset about it, so they really unloaded on us. But we were able to hold out, and eventually that Battle of the Bulge uh, uh, took uh, almost, to, almost to February 1st to the 5th of 1945 uh, to push the Germans back to where they were initially. And it was cold, very cold. A lot of people froze. A lot of people had amputated, had to have their feet amputated be because of freezing. That was the worst part of the battle was, was the freezing. Um, How so. did you keep warm? How did you keep from freezing yourself? Well, I was very lucky. I never did get hurt. And I, I guess I kind of looked after myself. I always carried four pair of socks and I'd put them next to my skin under my shirt to dry them out because you were in the snow and in the water and um, you know always miserable always wet and so I'd put them next to my body and one thing I did was change socks whenever my feet got wet I'd stop and change socks and rub my feet and that kept the circulation going a lot of people didn't think about that but uh, how did you how did you survive? Well, I guess uh, you you just uh, laid on the ground and hoped a shell won't land on you and uh, and you'd w really stay awake all the time. You were so miserable. Uh, it got to the point where uh, you know in the movies you'll see him jump into foxholes. Well, we jump into a foxhole and there'd be maybe six inches to to a foot of water with ice on top and you jump in and you can imagine you're going to stand there in ice water. I thought to myself, I'll take my chances on the ground. I'll just lie down on the ground and, uh, and I was fortunate in that respect because two of the guys that jumped into my foxhole got killed. A shell landed in the foxhole so I was very lucky, very lucky during the service. It seemed like I just missed I uh, missed being killed by, by luck. I know one time we had to uh, go to uh, uh, the other side, what I mean, cross the line to, to do a reconnaissance and, uh, and blow up some ammunition that the Germans, Germans had. 
and uh, we, we were all blackened, all ready to, to go. And the supply sergeant came out and said, I need somebody who can type. Well, I had taken typing in high school. So I raised my hand and uh, he said, fall out. Well, those five guys didn't get back. So, uh, you know, it's just, just luck. I never got wounded. I never broke a bone. I never, never It never got, bothered you that you were blind in one eye? Did that ever interfere? They never caught up with me. The, the problem I had really was a serious problem is the rifles are designed to shoot this way. And I couldn't. So I had to shoot left-handed. Okay. And I was used to that. But the problem was in loading it loading your rifle. If you're shooting this way, you, you push your magazine and you push your thumb down and you got to get your thumb up before it gets smashed. Well, I couldn't do it the left-handed way, so I had to do it with my, with my fingers. And that made it very awkward, you know. Um, but that's the only problem I had was uh, shooting, loading the rifle more than anything else. But I made good friends. We had a lot of friends. I had a lot of funny incidents. My wife would send me something to eat, and uh, and I liked chilies and uh, and chicken noodle soup. And one particular night, we were on guard way in the front. A fellow by the name of Harold Sturgeon and I, and it was so cold you couldn't believe it. So we had these little sterno cans, and I opened the chicken noodle soup and the chilies, and I dumped them in my canteen. Now my friend Sturgeon is saying, my God, it's cold. So I divided it, and I didn't tell him I had put the chilies in it. I said, here, drink it. And so he, oh, it was great. And then he starts swearing at me. I mean, it wasn't cold the rest of the night, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Neither one of us were cold the rest of the night. We kind of were sweating, but it was worth it, you know. And I had incidents like that where we just, we were all young, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and we just, a lot of us just, just had fun. It, it really wasn't fun looking back, but when you think about it now, you know, it was fun. You have a tendency to remember the, the good parts and forget the bad, and, and I've, I've forgotten the bad. I remember the good. During the, during the stay over in Europe, I had an odd incident happen to me. I had a friend that I was raised with that was raised in Reaptown, Nevada, and I was raised in Ruth, Nevada. And we were buddies all through high school. And I was in Paris in, in waiting to go eat at a USO, and this, somebody punched me in the arm and pushed me, you know, real hard. And, you know, in the paratroops you were taught that you had to fight. There was no choice, you had to fight. And I thought, oh God, here we go again, you know? And I turned around and there's this guy laughing at me. Well, we spent three days in Paris by ourselves and luckily we had enough money to really do it upright. <laughs> go to the Follies Berger, go to the nice restaurants. And those are incidents I remember. And that guy and I still visit each other. He comes up periodically and visits with us, you know. The other, there had two, three other friends. I learned that uh, they were around somewhere and couldn't locate them. And the friend located them through the internet for me and I called. And unfortunately, I was too late. They, the, all three of them had passed away. And, and it had been recently that they'd passed away. So outside of that, everything was great. Uh, the, the service in, uh, was very good to me. The government was good to me. It gave me an opportunity to go to school with a GI Bill. Otherwise, I would have worked in the mines the rest of my life. Uh, and I got to go to school. I got a degree in accounting. I got a degree in law and um, had a very good life after that. So, how did you communicate with his family when you were over in Europe? I used to write a letter to my wife every day. And when I got home, she had a big, big bag full of them, letters, you know? 
And I read them and I thought, oh my God, they're mushy. So I threw them, <laughs> threw them away when she, when she wasn't looking. <laughs> they, were just, they were just too much. <laughs> you, write them, you write them when you're feeling that way, you know, you're lonely and you're away. And, and then you read them back and you say, oh my God, did I say that? <laughs> Did you guys ever really get worried when you ran out of supplies after the Battle of the Bulge? Yes, yes, when, yes. Did you ever get to the point where there were no rations? Yes, there were no rations. There was no, uh, no medical supplies and no ammunition. For how long? Well, I would say about uh, four or five days there. We were really, really hurting. And then uh, the reason we weren't getting anything is uh, it was winter and fog had set in and clouds and the Air Force couldn't drop any assistance for us. But Christmas Day, the weather broke and here come the airplanes and they brought everything. And also at that same time, Patton got through with his third army and they assigned him the position to come in and save us and he broke through. So it seemed like everything turned in a period of a few hours, everything turned. Everybody had food to eat, the works, you know. Uh, I'll tell you of another funny incident. There was one fellow from Chicago that was afraid he was going to get killed before the war ended. And there's a picture there of, of Camp Marmalong, France, and you see all those tents? We were living in those tents. It was right after the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, I was cleaning my rifle and I, I, I had swiped uh, five gallons of gasoline from the mess sergeant. And in, I tore my rifle apart, put it in the barrel, and the barrel, I, I kicked the barrel some way and tipped the gasoline on the, on the ground. Well, there were six of us in a tent and we were just lying around there. And one guy said, put a match to it. The, 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 the odor was too strong, you know, the gasoline odor. And when you have gasoline, you just light a match and it burns it out. Well, he didn't realize it was five gallons of gas and I didn't stop to think. So I put a match to it and poof, the, <laughs> the tent went up in flames, you know. <laughs> well, we walked out of there and all you could see was the whites of our eyes, you know. <laughs> no eyebrows, hair burned, everything. And this fellow, Lascody, finally decided I was the guy that was going to try to kill him. So he, he came at me and the other guys held him. And I thought, man, am I in trouble. Luckily that day, it wasn't windy. If it had been windy, that whole camp would have burned, you know. So I thought, well, I'm in trouble. But no, the supply sergeant came by and he says, come on over. So I went over and uh, he issued me everything new. So I didn't have to clean anything, you know. I got new rifle new boots, everything new. So it turned out pretty good for all of us. But those are incidents that I remember. We could make a movie out of it. <laughs> Did you get a chance ever to, uh, to travel through Europe and just when you talk about Paris? Well, uh, I traveled a little bit through Europe. Uh, we, we were in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, and uh, London. Uh, I was in London for a week. Uh, uh, Southampton, um, La Havre, France, uh, in Paris. I, I went to like uh, Napoleon's tomb and uh, the Church of Notre Dame, the Champs Elysees, the uh, Follies Berger. I went through a perfume factory. Um, we were there three days, so we took advantage of it. In Germany, I would travel through little towns. Austria the same way. Uh, so I, I got to see a lot of things, yeah. Nice, France, I got, went down to Nice, France and uh, saw the southern part of France. I never was in Italy, but uh, other than that, it was okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I imagine you have many more funny stories. It oh, says we, here, what are the pranks that you guys would pull on each other? I'll let you just keep on going down this list. I'm going to go see how you do it. Okay. So other than that, I'll answer whatever questions you want. Uh, 
my experiences were on the plus. What were, what were some of the other things you thought? What were some of the other things you thought on this event? I didn't hear you, please. Some of the other pranks. Oh, there was one prank one time. Uh, uh, our uh, a squad sergeant got all dressed up one Friday. He was going to go out on a date, and uh, I set up a trap like a bucket of water over the top of the transom, you know, and I expected to get, to get my buddy. And so I'm lying on the cot, and I hear the walking back, and I thought, that doesn't sound like daily. That was my, one of my buddies. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, and he opened, and this water fell on him, and he had his uniform, his dress uniform on, his medals and all that stuff. Well, needless to say, I had to clean garbage cans with a toothbrush for oh. two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about it, really. Yeah. It was a, the worst thing was being away from home and being away from your wife, you know, because when you're newlywed, you want to be where, you want to be together, but, but you overcome that. Where were you when your service ended? Where were you when your service ended? It, when, in, in the service? Yeah, when, when it ended, where were you? In um, Reims, France. That's where we had been stationed uh, in, in the scuttlebutt test, was that we were going to, uh, to uh, get ready to make another push, and all of a sudden, it was made seventh or May sixth around there and they start saying, Well the war's gonna be over, the war's gonna be over and bam it was over and that was it. It was just a, a big relief for all of us. But as soon as that happened then they said, Well, you're going you the hundred and first and eighty second were supposed to go to Japan uh, because it was gonna be an invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. So they started training us for that, and like I say, sometime in August, after they dropped the atomic bomb, uh, the war ended, and that was it. Um, did you keep a personal diary while you were there? Or that's just letters that you wrote? Did you keep a personal diary? No, I didn't. I didn't keep a personal diary. You didn't? No. No. We, we, we were lucky being in the paratroops, we were lucky because we got paid well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, an infantry soldier got $50 a month base pay, depending on rank. And because you were a paratrooper, you got a 100% bonus. That would make it $100 a month. And then if you were in combat, you got another, I, I believe, $20 a month. That made it 120 mm -hmm. And then we got a bonus from the French government for 1775. So my wife was doing pretty well. <laughs> you know, I, I'd send her a pretty good allotment each month, and we, she was doing pretty well. But she was still in high school, and she didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so, and when you came, where did you live when you came back? Well, I went back to Ruth when I came back. That's the first thing I did. and. Uh, like I say, I uh, thought about it for a while, not very long, and I thought, well, do I want to go back in the mines or take advantage of the GI Bill? Mm -hmm. So in September, uh, August, I should say August of 1946, we moved over here to Reno, and I started a college here. Have you joined any veterans organizations? I belong to the VFW. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I joined the VFW. And uh, that's the only one, I think. How did your service and experiences affect your life? I'm sorry, yeah. How has your, um, your service and experiences affected your life? Yeah. Oh, I think it's been a complete plus in that it, it gave me 
uh, well, the service led to the GI Bill, and the GI Bill led to an education which led to a much better life. I would never have had uh, uh, the standard of life that I and my family have had because let's assume I hadn't gone to the service. I'd have worked in the mines till, till I retired, uh, and I wouldn't have been able to be a professional man, to be my own boss. Uh, so uh, it was a total plus for me. Uh, my income probably quadrupled or even maybe five times what I would have been making. It, it empowered me to raise my children better, to have a better home. Uh, it, it, it was just positive all the way around. How do I feel about war now? I'm dead set against it. I, I think that we are, are sending our young, our soldiers, to foreign countries, first of all, where we're not invited, where we're not wanted, and they're being killed for nothing. And it really irritates me when our leaders call and get on TV and say, so they shall not have died in vain. Well, they say that every time, and so on, that'll never happen again. And it happens every time. Uh, you take Korea. Uh, we, we had to get involved in Korea. We had no choice there because they attacked us. But Vietnam was an un unnecessary war. That was a manufactured war from what I've read, and I've tried to read on these things before I talk about them. And I think it was unnecessary and an unpopular war and uh, it cost over $200 billion, I understand, and I often think, what would this country be like if we had spent $200 billion on schools, hospitals, uh, uh, our infrastructure? It would be fantastic. And now we get involved in this war over there, and you hear the president, the other day he was talking about we're going to free people, and I think, well, what about the freedom of people in this country? How about 35 million that go hungry every day? 25 million children go to bed hungry every night. Teachers have to buy pencils and paper for kids to, to do their assignments in schools. Uh, to me, it's a complete waste of the assets of the nation. Uh, and uh, economically, it's ruining us. By the time we get through with this war, who knows where it's going to lead us, you know. Uh, so I'm very, very unhappy about the way things are now. I, I don't understand why we can't settle, settle problems without having to have a war. And, and it seems to me that the people that always commit us to war are the people that don't go to war, you know. They sit back here and they tell us now. You know, I, I listened to Bush the other night, and he says, I go to bed every night thinking about the, our young soldiers that are over there being killed. And I think, what a laugh that is. You sent them over there. You sent them over there on a phony war. And that, that, that's a phony war. That's all it is. It's a war to control some necessary elements of industry, and in this instance, it's oil. It's a war to control the oil of the world, you know. And we do things thinking nobody's going to find out the true purpose. And it always comes out in a democracy. You can't do things secretly. Sooner or later, people are going to find out about it. And that's what's happening now. What organizations? Yeah. Veterans? Have you joined any, have you done any of the activities? No, no, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not very participatory in, in, uh, in uh, organizations like that. I, I'd rather do things myself, you know, if I want to do something, I do it myself, rather than get in groups. Uh, groups get too politicized in a hurry. There's all of a sudden there's a click here and there's a click there and, and they're running things. And I, I would rather be, if I want to do something, 
I'll go do it and forget about it. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered yet? I'm, I'm sorry, I guess I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, no, no. I think uh, that about covers it. Yeah, that about covers it, really. It's, uh, it's been pleasant talking to you and being interviewed by you and remembering funny incidents. So I want to thank you for the opportunity, okay? Thank you. Now that we're off, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, And what are those? That's a picture right after, uh, right after the Battle of the Bulge. And the camp is Camp Marmelon, France, in February of 1946. Mm -hmm. And that's where that dastardly fire occurred. <laughs> <laughs> and then what are those down there on the bottom? Well, this is the insignia of the 101st Airborne. And that's the 82nd Airborne, and these are the jump, uh, jump wings, parachute wings. And I was in both, both uh, divisions. Okay. I need to get the picture. Taken in Belgium after the war. Notice I had hair. <laughs> well, thank you very much.